And now, Paul, at this time, I will turn the webinar over to you. Great. Thanks, Katie. Uh, welcome, everyone. This uh, session, as Katie mentioned, is um, all about jurist fee schedules. And she also mentioned that you can ask your questions via that text panel. But I also kind of uh, widen that tool to, as we go through, if you've lived uh, fee schedules in your own firm and you have something you found that was helpful or saved you time, uh, why don't we make it open to uh, tips? So if you happen to want to share something and I haven't mentioned it, feel free. I like to be able to leverage uh, a big group like this in a webinar that you can kind of share something that you've learned uh, being on the ground, as it were, with these fee schedules. So uh, just a little background on uh, me as a trainer, just so you know that I've been um, teaching people. I've been a trainer for about 20, 22 years now, primarily training adults like all of you guys in uh, different types of software. Most recently, the Juris suite of products, including Juris Suite, Juris Core, and also one of our other products called PC Law. So it's um, it's um, joy to actually help you guys today and walk through this topic. So let's go ahead and what we're going to do is kind of talk about some topics before we actually jump into Juris and look at fee schedules in a virtual environment. Um, so starting off, what are Juris fee schedules? So I know a lot of times we'll have experienced people in these webinars as well as people may have just started the program or just learning it at their firm. So obviously Juris fee schedules are the tool that, we're, that Juris uses to help you um, kind of sculpt how you're going, to you're going to charge your clients. And as we'll see in a moment, there's a lot of flexibility built into that function. And you can only access it from Juris Core. You can't get to it from Juris Suite if you have that program. Much of the accounts payable, and accounts receivable, and billing is all captured inside of Juris Core. As you can see, you can find them under the Tables section in Juris Core, and it's got the little fee schedules icon. And let's go ahead and kind of talk about what they are and, and how they're used. So you. When you create one from scratch, you're essentially just giving a uh, identifier code and a description of what it is. So it's a very, you know, as we'll see, a very small little dialog box to, to get one going. But they, um, they are made up of three main areas. And those three main areas are task codes, timekeepers, and personnel types. And what Juris has built over the years with this function is a very flexible tool that allows for the various and myriad different ways that attorneys and partners and folks at your firm could potentially charge a client. There's so many different ways that you can uh, bring in customers and how contracts are sculpted that Juris built an extremely um, wide range of, of ways you can create these fee schedules and accommodate those needs. So it, as having trained Juris for a number of years, when I first learned it, this was probably one of the more challenging topics to understand because it's so flexible. It can seem a little overwhelming at first, um, and there's, you know, a sense that there's too many pieces to this, and how does it know one thing over another? So, as I said, the icons are just timekeepers, personnel, and person, and uh, task codes. And let's look at, you know, how that works, though, as far as Juris is concerned. Um, many of you, may, this may be a little review, but when Juris is looking at a fee schedule connected to a client or matter, it's going to go in a certain hierarchy of those three topics to decide what to bill a client for a certain task. And the first thing it's going to look at is the task codes. So if you have any task codes that are, can, that are set up within Juris and they're assigned to a certain uh, amount or fee, then when Juris is looking inside the fee schedule and it sees that exact task code that say you know Bill Morrison there at the firm entered in his in his time entry then it says whoa I've got that task code we charge five hundred dollars for that and I'm going to stop looking and that that essentially is a way that you can set up these uh, you might call them like um, flat fee sorts of things like uh, I've had firms that have do real estate work for um, for clients and they'll have Maybe they'll do real estate closings for individuals or small companies, and they have a task code for, for real estate closings. And when the attorney enters that code, it doesn't matter if the attorney or, uh, you know, or a lawyer worked seven hours on that task or three and a half hours, that they use the closing task code. So Jura says, oh, I've got it. We charge $350 for that task code. I'm done looking. 
it doesn't matter if that attorney charges $200 an hour. That's the, pro the first step in the process. So a lot of firms may not use those task codes in that way, but think about it as a way that if you ever need to simplify such a, such a process where you, um, you let the system decide exactly what's going to be charged for certain things, then you just set up a task code, which you can do very easily, and then assign it to a, f a fee schedule. And we'll look at that. The next thing, if Juris can't find what it's looking for in task codes, it goes down to timekeepers. It looks at how many, what timekeepers are listed in that fee schedule for that client. And if it finds the person who's entering time in that list, it looks over to their rate and then knows, okay, well, that's the rate I'm going to use uh, for that entry. And lastly is personnel types. And that is, if again, if the system can't find a task code or a timekeeper, then it's going to look under personnel types. And uh, personnel types are just categories of, of, of workers there at the firm. And when it, if it finds a person is under a certain category and that personnel type is listed for that fee schedule, then it looks at that amount of money and uh, that rate and goes with that. Now again, uh, fee schedules can be created with obviously different names or uh, identifiers, but there is always a standard rate fee schedule in Juris. That is, you might think of it like the um, foundational fee schedule. It's the one that Juris has to have in case it can't find a rate anywhere else. So if you have a, 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 a rate schedule, a fee schedule, for example, that's for uh, discounted clients, and um, Juris can't find the specific task code or timekeeper or personnel type, there's no match, then it will always be able to look back at that standard rate fee schedule to get the individual's rate, their hourly rate. So Juris will never be lost and uh, come up empty-handed when it comes to rates like that. So there is a certain hierarchy, and the, uh, the system does abide by it. And that's once we, you kind of get a handle on that, then uh, it's easier to kind of comprehend how this process works. Now, that being said, let's, enough going on and on about that in uh, PowerPoint. Let me go ahead over to a virtual environment where I have Juris installed. And you're probably going to see the screen flash for a moment as I go full screen. And what I'm going to do is log into a virtual environment uh, with Juris installed. And I'm going to log in with an SMGR admin login. And let's go ahead and look at these things and kind of dive into using them, since that's why we're here. So as, as I said earlier, you're going to find fee schedules under the table section over to the left, and you're going to see fee schedules here. Now in our training environment, we only have three. There's that standard rate fee schedule, ISOF fee schedule, and a discount fee schedule. Now, uh, in many cases, I know probably many of you who are on this call right now are like, well, that's an amazingly small list. A lot of firms will have dozens, or I've heard of some folks in my class who've had over 100 or 200 uh, fee schedules because the various ways that you bring clients on via contracts or whatever process means a lot of firms will then have to create a specific type of fee schedule. And I'll talk about some, some best practices at the end of the session to kind of help you maybe reduce that, that, that issue in the future. But let's look at some of these. For example, I'm going to open up the discount fee schedule. Say, for example, at our you know, fictitious firm, we have a fee schedule for those clients that we want to offer a, a discounted rate. Maybe these are clients that we've had for a long time or when we, um, you know, we bring on a, a client that we are just, you know, is, is associated with a previous client, we may offer them a discounted rate. So as favorite clients, you know, they may be associated with this discount fee schedule. So as I said, the first thing that the jurist looks at if this was connected to a client is the task codes. So if you open up task codes, there's no task codes connected to this fee schedule. And I'll show you one that has one. Then it'll always go next to the timekeepers in that fee schedule. And in this case, again, none specifically listed. That doesn't mean that these people aren't going to get, if there's individuals at the firm, that they won't be charging time. It just means there's none connected to this one. Lastly, personnel types. Ah, here we go. So primarily what we've done is created a fee schedule where we're going to give discounted rates based on the personnel type of the individuals who are charging on that case. So for example, uh, you know, legal assistants get fifty or fifty dollars an hour. Paralegal seventy-five. Associates charge a hundred, and uh, those categorize as other. 
at $50. And again, if there's uh, categories or personnel type categories that aren't listed here, then the system will always default back to this standard rate fee schedule back here. But there's, here's an opportunity to, to see an example of a fee schedule that's leveraging personnel types to identify, in this case, lower rates. Now that's just one example. Say, for example, uh, we created one called the iSoft fee schedule. So as you can probably imagine, that's a rather unusual name, right? It probably a, could be a client name, one of our larger clients. So I'm going to open up that one. And again, tend to go through the exact same process. Juris is going to look at task codes. No task codes connected to this one. Any timekeepers? Ah, Mitch Martin. Mitch Martin is charging $225 an hour for his time if he's connected to a, a client or matter that has this fee schedule connected to it. So this might be an example of, in the real world, Maybe Mitch actually was um, a friend of the CEO at this company, and so he agreed when they came on board to give a modified or reduced rate. So here's a way to just kind of highlight just Mitch getting a reduced rate uh, when charging against that client. So, and if anyone else is charging, then the system, of course, as I'm, you're going to see next, is the last thing it's going to look at is personnel types. And again, this is an example where iSoft also, we probably contracted that additional different rates are associated by personnel type. And these are you know, larger cost rates for these different uh, categories of personnel types. So you're starting to see a little bit of the flexibility that the system uh, allows for. And granted, with that flexibility, as you probably, many of you are nodding right now, comes uh, some complexity. And then with that complexity is if you have different clients with different needs, Will you need another, uh, yet another uh, fee schedule for that? And in many cases, you may have to just create another fee schedule. But there are ways, and I'll talk about it at the end of the session, that you may be able to reduce that, um, that need to add to the list. So that's an example of a fee schedule that's tied pretty much to a single client. Last is the standard rate fee schedule. And I'll just briefly talk about this. This is always, you're always going to see a standard rate fee schedule inside of Juris. And in this case, Notice, for the first time, if I click on task codes, ah, here's an example where when this was created, that yes, we may do some real estate work, and we do a lot of closings for um, individuals or companies. And so if an individual was to enter the P600 task code, and we're allowing task and activity codes, for example, on time entries, then immediately Jura stops looking. It says, ah, P600. One hour, rate 300, amount 300, $300 for that work. And so it's no longer going to go any further with that time entry. It doesn't matter if the person who entered the code charges $350 an hour. The system stops looking for that once it, gabs, once it grabs that six P600 task code. Next is, and I'm just going along the hierarchy, is timekeepers. This is everyone. So just for your own sake, this is at our, we have a small firm. We only have 13 people who are tracking their as time entry uh, individuals. We've got 13 folks here, and these are all listed here because these are the standard rates for every individual. If I was to go into, say, Juan Perro's um, user ID right now, it would say $200 an hour in his record. So the system automatically builds these. If I change this rate right here, then it's automatically going to change their rate on their user ID file in Juris. It's an example of the two pieces being connected inside the software. So that's an example of just how they work. And for those of you on, on the session who are well familiar with how this hierarchy works, uh, this may be a little bit of a review. But let's talk about how the main rubber meets the road approach is how do you uh, connect these, these fee schedules to individual clients. So what I'm going to do is close down the fee schedule and go into our client list, again, under tables. So if you're under tables, you can get, obviously, different types of codes and time entry uh, topics, timekeepers. But under clients, let's say we were going to make a, uh, a change to one of our clients and how we were charging them. Maybe the situation has changed. We have an updated contract with them. Say I'm going to go to Arch Solutions, one of our clients. Now this is a client record, and as you can see, there's a series of tabs, and below here is the, the folder for the matters or cases underneath that client. If I go under the billing tab, 
This is where you indicate which fee schedule that you're connecting to the client. So there's the list. And if we had added more, we would have seen more if we wanted to, uh, for example, create a brand new fee schedule. Say, for example, that this new client has been with us for a while, and we're going to change how we charge them from their standard, from the standard rate fee schedule to the discount fee schedule. Now, as soon as I do that, you may notice that something popped up on the screen. And that is this Propagate Changes button at the top. Whenever you make a change on a client record, you will get this little pop-up here with a checkbox. And if you check it, essentially what you're telling Juris is when I save this file, you're going to propagate this information I just changed down to the matters underneath this client or the children underneath this parent, if you will. And so if, for example, I was to save this file, it's going to say, whoa, OK, you changed something. And you told me you want to propagate it down. Do you want to? Pr you have two choices here. You can propagate it to all the matters for the client, and it doesn't matter what the original value was. Always change it to whatever I changed it to here, or and this is by default. Propagate that change only to the matters with the same original value. So, say for example, there were two matters under this client that were set to standard, and um, and another one that was set to iSoft for whatever reason. Then it's only going to affect those two, not all three. But in this case, I do want to change the, ch the child or children underneath this because all of the cases under this client are affected by this change. We made that part of our updated contract. So if I click OK here, then I go under Matters. In fact, we have three cases for this client. I'll go under Jones versus Arch Solutions. And again, this is a matters. This is just a matter record. And much of this comes cascading down from the client record. But there is a billing tab, and look at that. Fee schedule has automatically populated that change so that you, can, uh, you don't have to worry about that. It's automatically going to be updated. Now, at this point, I do like to mention one key thing, and it's available on both matters and clients, and that is this idea of note cards. And I've had many people in my classes who have not been aware that this little feature is available. So say, for example, and I'll use the one on the client record. So I'm going to close the matter record and go back to the client. There it is right here, a little deck of cards, I call it. But this little note card feature is wonderful. Think of it like virtual Post-it notes inside of Juris. And say, for example, um, you wanted to make uh, an, you know, a note of some sort that there was uh, a new contract. And so um, if you want to make an adjustment or you want to make a record that, that stores this, this change, um, then you can create these. And I'll just make a quick note. And pardon me if I misspelled anything. But this is just a quick note about the fact that on the first of this month, we had an updated contract with this client. And that's why we've gone to this discounted fee schedule. Um, it just, it just, I love this tool. And I've done webinars just on all the different capabilities of note cards. But think of it this way. Instead of having a paper file, that you then have to track down different changes or updates to clients over the months and years. It's nice to be able to leverage this no card feature. You can have as many as you want. I mean, you can just keep creating new cards, and you'll see they'll turn into a little cascade that you can kind of uh, click through. And you can even search through the content of no cards. And that's a nice feature. So just wanted to touch on that. That's a, a feature that's out there should you decide that you need it. And thereby, you can you know have people at your firm uh, be aware that you know we keep updated con or, um, client information in the note cards on those records. So if you have a question, reference those before you start calling people around the office uh, trying to look for an answer. OK, I, I find it to be a nice feature. Now, say for example, and I'll close up this client, say you have a lot of fee schedules. Let's get back to fee schedules. Say you do have like you know 72 fee schedules. You know your firm's been using Juris for a number of years, and they've just kind of accumulated. That um, if you need to find one quick, notice that you do under the Tools feature, click Find. You'll always be able to instead of scrolling through and trying to find say the name of a client that's in the description, you can always search using this feature. And I'll just enter iSoft. Notice there's a little selector here for case sensitive. I recommend leaving that unchecked. 
And what it's doing is it's looking in the fee schedules tables folder, and I can click and quickly find one. Now, granted, mine, I only have three, but as I said, sometimes this list is very long, and just finding what you're after or you're looking for can take time. And any you know opportunity to save you guys time is something I like to share. So just don't forget, it's, gonna, it's in many areas of tourists, you'll find that find, you'll locate the find feature under the tools menu for batches and so forth, so you'll always be able to kind of locate it under the tools menu. Now, how to find them, that's great. What if you have to delete a fee schedule? You know, there's times when, like I said, there's a long list and you'd like, this is getting crazy, let's delete some of these. So you can't inactivate fee schedules right now. I'm hoping and others are hoping that'll be an, a feature in future releases or maybe the next release of Juris where you can inactivate a fee schedule. But if I needed to, say, delete a fee schedule like the discounted fee schedule, I can select delete from the form drop down and it will delete it. It will delete it if there's no activity that's connected to the fee schedule. So there's no, say, entries or task codes that are active, that aren't posted. And so if there's no connectivity to the fee schedule, it's truly on its own or, or undisconnected, then you can delete it. But in this case, I'm going to get a, a fairly common error here. Cannot delete the fee schedule because several other areas depend on it. And so here's an example where I can't delete it. But again, I will show you later that there's ways to reduce the, uh, the hassle factor of those that are that are kind of cluttering up your list, and uh, hopefully you'll find that to be a, a helpful process. Now, next is, say for example, that you have um, a situation where you want to uh, retroactively change uh, build rates um, connected to fee schedules or timekeepers. There's also a feature for retroactively changing rates. And you can see it if I close down this fee schedule. It's actually under the tools menu, but notice it's called retroactive rate changes, and it's grayed out here. Uh, when I first learned Juris, I wondered why would they gray this out? What am I missing here? And the fact is that you can't adjust you know, these rates that are going to affect you know, past entries without Juris being in what's called maintenance mode. And some of you may have may be familiar with that process of turning the software into maintenance mode. And the way you do it, essentially maintenance mode is um, you want everyone out of the software, and then when you put the system in the maintenance mode, it allows for lower level access to settings and um, design elements and things like that inside the software. The way you get to the to the to the maintenance mode is to go under setup and manage. And you'll see a little icon there for change mode. And in this case, notice it is running in normal mode. We, you could also have it in backup mode if you were backing up the database. But in our case, I want it to be in maintenance mode. As soon as I click it, dialog box disappears. I get a lot more icons to work with here on my screen because now I'm in this you know, lower level mode. I could even change the name of the firm and really uh, limit my career uh, path by changing it to something zany. But in my case, I just want to um, uh, actually work with these build rates and retro retroactively change them. So once it's in maintenance mode, I'm going to go back under tables to fee schedules and then under tools. Now I can get to retroactive rate changes. So this is, a, there's a series of tabs up top and there's a long list of, there's a long entry in the help file that talks about all of the details of this screen and what it encompasses. But essentially, it's a way for you to um, adjust or retro retroactively change um, fee schedules themselves here. So I could actually select individual fee schedules. And I can even select to override any user entered values and revert to the fee schedule. For example, if someone has been changing their rates. I can also, and if I don't want to change by fee schedule, I can change by uh, apply these changes based on timekeepers personnel types, task codes, notice this is all connected to what we were looking at in fee schedules, and then even uh, a range, that is a, seri a, a change to a certain clients or clients and um, specific matters beneath those clients. Or I can even select clients and it'll select and change all the matters beneath that client. 
So a lot of control here that, that you have at your fingertips to change uh, rates that are already posted. These are not going to change unposted batches uh, or unbilled time. It's only going to affect build or posted time entries. Now the last tab I wanted to show you is this is the date range that you're, you're asking for this retroactive change to be affected by. So you will have to enter the beginning and ending date to tell Juris what's the date range that you want to make these changes on across. Lastly, just for those of you who probably have seen this little note, whenever you make a change to the, you know, the general ledger and you're going to adjusting past information, Juris will always ask whether you want to post those changes based on today's date or the date of the original entry. And so this, there's no right or, ran, right, right or wrong answer here. It's usually whatever your CPA has told you is how your firm's going to uh, handle how you post you know, previous changes to the general ledger. So you know, that's a nice tool. If you need to be able to uh, retroactively change rates that are already in the system, uh, that's your tool to allow you to do that. I will say though, though there's a couple things that, a lot, that folks really don't realize are available that are settings that affect fee schedules and I want to highlight them because they're just not easy. You don't know about them until you kind of see them. And that's why we have these, these webinars to kind of highlight some less than common things. These are, there's two key settings that you can affect related to fee schedules and they are both only available in maintenance mode. So I'm going to leave this system in maintenance mode and I'm going to go uh, under setup and manage. Remember that's where I changed the mode to maintenance but I have these additional icons. One of them that you're only going to be able to see when the system's in maintenance mode is this firm options icon. And what this is, and I'll double click on it, is a wealth of different very low level settings that affect how Juris works. And in this case, notice there's over, I don't know, 10 or 12 different um, tabs related to collections or expense and journal entries, fee entries, uh, conflict checking. But under the trans tab, there is a setting that allows you to change what your standard rate schedule is. And notice uh, both fee and expense schedule. And notice that you could change this here. You don't have to, and I'll, I'll talk about a neat tip at the end, you don't have to make your standard rate schedule be the STDR one in your list. If you have a new year and you want to use a new standard rate schedule for just this year, then all you need to do is create the new schedule, call it something, and select it from here. And then the system will consider that to be the standard rate fee schedule going forward. So a nice way to make the system work more efficiently by telling it what, that there's a different standard rate fee schedule um, from this point forward. Now that's one key thing. The next is under the miscellaneous tab over here. And that is a neat tool that, and it's, notice there's a variety of different checkboxes here, radio buttons, but there's one here I want to bring your attention to, and that is this one right here, notify if the matter fee schedule different from client. That is, and I'll check it here, if the matter, for some reason, the matter fee schedule on a, on a, on a client's case is different from the one that was assigned at the client level, let me know or let anyone know who's working with clients because that could be a red flag that something is incorrect. In other words, you shouldn't be assigning a different fee schedule at the matter level if, for example, we've created one for that entire client. So I'm going to go ahead and save that one actually and save that setting and come back and uh, I'll go ahead and take it out of maintenance mode and put it back into normal mode. And let's say that that you know a couple weeks go by and, and someone's working in the system and they're in the, the client list. And for example, let's go under say Arch Solutions. And notice in the billing, it, uh, as we saw, that this Arch Solutions has the discounted fee schedule connected to it. Now I'm going to go to the matters. And as we saw, there's you know three cases we're working on for this client. I'm going to open up, say, the last one. And I'm going to set the last one to a different fee schedule. Boom. 
as soon as I do that, it's going to remind me the selected matter fee schedule does not match the client's fee schedule. So it's going to, it's going to, it's not going to stop me from entering it, guys. It will not stop me from entering it. It's just an alert. So I can save and come back up one level. It's going to, it's going to keep popping up and reminding me. But essentially, it's a way, and it did record that, of keeping that foremost in your mind that there is a disconnect, and it'll keep doing this. So it's, it's just a way to, um, to you know, keep that foremost in your mind that you are breaking from whatever fee schedule that you had assigned at the client level. Okay, so uh, a neat little feature that if you ever have that happen, that you can avoid it or at least uh, reduce any potential problems if those pop up by turning on that feature, that one little checkbox. Okay, so um, those were kind of the things I wanted to show in the live environment. And one of the, we've, I've been alluding to these best practices. And I want to come back into my presentation, guys, and kind of talk about those. So I've gathered some of these from uh, some of the consultants who, uh, my own background and the consultants who work closely with clients. And let's talk about some of these, and they may be of help for you. That is, first is share your fee schedules uh, across multiple clients as, as you're able to, as appropriate. You can create fee schedules based on um, a similar, uh, the different practice areas at your firm, for example, or uh, those by a certain billing attorney. That way, instead of creating them for every time, you know, Kevin Morrison, uh, the partner, is working on a firm, I've got to create very similar or essentially um, duplicate versions of fee schedules, create one, and then, you know, give it an indicator that it's associated with that partner, for example. Now, granted, that first one is, is rather hard because a lot of times there may be just even a small difference between how you're charging clients and thereby, you know, you would need another fee schedule. Make the description meaningful, second one. That's important just because as you're creating them, it, you, a lot of times people are going to be referencing them later. And having a, descript, a description that has key phrases or words in it that people can pick up on will be helpful for uh, later uh, review. Possibly have an annual fee schedule checkup each year. Put it on the schedule to review the fee schedules and see if there's any that need to be identified as um, outdated. Uh, and I'll show you some some examples of how to do that, or those that you uh, that you know may need to be adjusted, or you may need new ones for a uh, a new um, area that potentially your firm is moving into that year. Uh, you can also set the fee schedules to standard on any closed matters. So if you have any closed matters and any clients where all the matters are closed, you can set the fee schedule on those clients and matters to standard, so that they're no longer connected to fee schedules that uh, you've got in your list. In other words, instead of you've got all these different um, fee schedules that are connected to closed matters and clients, and thereby it won't let you delete them, have a process where as matters are closed, it's just a practice where you, s you go in and set the matter fee schedule to the standard. That way it's no longer connected to those potentially individual fee schedules and thereby uh, help you clean those up later. You can proceed the description of unused fee schedules with triple Z, for example. That way you can see at a glance and if you can sort on the column, the description column for your um, jurist fee schedules, and then you can, it'll move all of your unused ones to the bottom of the list. Get them out of your visual range so you don't have to you don't see those anymore, and you can tell those are the unused ones uh, all the way at the bottom out of the way. Lastly, it, sometimes it's valuable to create a new standard uh, fee schedule for new clients each year, thereby uh, utilizing um, that process I showed you in the firm options where you can set the fee, uh, the standard rate fee schedule to something different, and that's the new standard for new clients that year. So again, you're making the system work a little more efficiently rather than having to uh, you know, kind of go around your elbow to change that every time. So there's just some hints and tips there. I know that probably there's a number of people on the call who may have some ideas uh, or questions. So what I'm going to do is kind of open it up to, as um, Katie mentioned, you can type into that box. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to ask them. If I don't know them, I will get the answer for you guys. And again, if you have something that you found that helped you with fee schedules, feel free to 
um, share that with the group. So Katie, any questions come through? Yes. Well, first off, I do want to say thank you so much, Paul, for your very informative session. So this does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar. And as a reminder, if you do have questions, please feel free to ask them via the questions pane located on your webinar control panel. Um, we do have several questions that already came through, um, what, or questions and tips, a little bit of both. Um, okay. Our first, I think, tip is no cards might be included in conflict check search results, and some may, may unwantingly pop up if content happen to include what you're searching for. So, obviously, gotcha. something to be aware of. Be aware of, yes. Our next um, statement is, I guess this is, a, this is a question for you, Paul. Why does mm -hmm. a retroactive fee change apply to posted and build time as opposed to unbilled time? I don't want to change fees already billed to a client. So is there a way to change that? Yeah, that, that, that tool is designed for any changes you need to make to uh, pass time. So if you need to change unbilled time, then uh, obviously you can go in, if, for example, you've got unbilled time and you're in, say, an edit pre-bill stage, you haven't even sent the bill out, um, then you're going to change those time entries using typical ways like uh, edit pre-bill or enter adjust time entries um, through the, the software itself. It's only retroactive. That tool is designed literally to go back only to posted time. So um, for example, if you needed to change unbilled time, you could create a pre-bill, adjust that time, and then uh, go through your typical billing process. And um, that would be my, my suggestion. OK, great. Um, Next, Melanie gives a good tip saying, we have some set it and forget it fee schedules that don't need to be changed. Others are for individuals only. So we've placed symbols at the beginning of the description so we can skip oh. over them. <laughs> Wonderful tip. I love that. Uh, that was, that's a great idea. Symbols, think of it this way. If you can leverage symbols or a series of characters like the triple Z, uh, then do so to alleviate hassles when it comes to uh, long, long lists and being able to identify them. That's a, that's a great tip. I'm going to add that to my list, symbols. Now, this may be um, similar to the question I just asked, but let me ask it just in case because I think there are a little, a little bit of differences here. With regard to retroactive rate changes, how do they affect time entries on existing pre-bills with both as-worked and as-billed rates? be changed? And is it possible to use multiple sections when indicating how the system should select which entries to change? For example, timekeeper and date. That was yeah. a lot, so if I need to repeat, let me know. No, no that's good. No, the second, the second part of that question is you cannot change multiple things in that screen at once. You can't change task codes and timekeepers at the same time. So you'll note the help file for retroactive rate changes will indicate that. So you can only change one of the the three areas at a time. So that is a limitation of that. Um, when it comes to changing something on a pre-bill um, or changing time that's unbilled, then you know, and I you know, I teach the billing process. Then by going into the edit pre-bill and making your, that's where you can make your uh, rate changes, uh, hour changes, amount changes, right there on the edit pre-bill screen. And it's only when, since those are not posted, it's only when you have posted the bill, does jurists consider that that billing process is done and that those are quote unquote posted and then can they be affected by that retroactive rate change. Until you post your bills, then you're, they're still uh, you know, unbilled and the billing process is not complete and so you're going to have to be able, to, you're going to, the only way to change those rates and time entries is to do them as you're probably already doing them, is going in and adjusting them uh, on the edit pre-bill uh, screens. That, that's what I would recommend. Okay, great. Anything else? Okay. Our next question is, can we uh, review again the impact of changing a fee schedule on an existing client? 
For example, sure. the client has a has fee schedule ABC, and I'm changing to XYZ. I don't want any existing matters to change, but I want to change any new matters. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Let's go ahead and t take a look at that real quick. So, if you're in a client and you want to, oh, I see what you're getting at. If I have, uh, for example, the Dawson Consulting Group as a client, and I create any new matters then what I can do is change the uh, fee schedule to a new fee, fee schedule like discount and then I do not select this propagate changes button right so I don't select this I save it and now if I create a new matter using my matters button down here this folder and I create a brand new matter as you guys are probably aware if you go to the well at this point it's going to ask me for you know some information so I can move forward and when I get to billing now, look what it did. So by not selecting that propagate changes button, when you made the change at the client level, it says, okay, I'm only changing that fee schedule at the, at the, at the, client, rec at the client record. Any new matters you create from that point forward, Juris automatically pulls whatever fee schedule it saw at the client level and drops it into the, the matter record, fee, the matter record itself. So Make sure to do it in just like I said, when you change it at the client level, do not propagate it down to the old matters, but Juris, every time you create a new one, will assign the one you had assigned at the client level and thereby save you time. That's a great question. I'm glad that was brought up. Great. Our next question is, when would you need to adjust build time, and does it change on the posted invoice? They're just kind of confused there. Mm. Yeah, so when, you're, when you have to change build time, then, of course, if, if at all possible, make sure that the time that's coming over from individuals from, say, Jura Suite is, is correct, and whatever you can do in that regard to set up rules at Jura Suite level. You remember, if you're using Jura Suite, you can set up rules that guide or help um, uh, alleviate problems at the source, for example. Um, but when you've got time that's come in and it has to be adjusted, then um, you can, uh, you know, obviously if you, you need to make a change prior to uh, billing, you can do that. But what the main way I, I recommend making changes is when you come to your billing process, whether it's weekly or monthly, um, as you're doing pre-bill editing, adjust your time entries or billing rates right there on the edit pre-bill uh, screens. That's, um, that's probably your, your most efficient way because you can do all of them in one fell swoop. If there's seven, you can do them on the same screen. Remember, you've got a wealth of tools that Juris offers when you're editing pre-bills, um, but you could change them prior to that, but I just find it more efficient to do it at the pre-bill editing stage. Okay, Any great. Other questions? Yes, our next question is, is there a way to run a report that shows all the client specific fee schedules that apply to it? Gosh, you know, that's a good question. I don't know of a specific one. There probably is because I know in your suite, for example, we have over 870 reports. Um, it would just be a matter of, of, of searching. Uh, and if you just have Juris Core, then of course, you're going to have to kind of go through the uh, reports that you have here uh, inside the software. But if you're using Jura Suite, then I do recommend uh, just using the search box and searching on the phrase fee schedules because there might be a master list that gives you that exact data. I don't know offhand, guy, uh, whoever asked that, because I'm just not familiar with all of the different reports, but my gut tells me if there's been more than a handful of people who've needed that information over the years, we, our development team and report folks have created a report for that. So just go into Jura Suite, search on fee schedules inside the report module, see what comes up. I bet you there is one. Great. Um, our next question is, my retroactive changes, um, changes the unbilled time and unposted time right now. And I'm on 2.6, has that changed? Hmm. Yeah, we're running 2.7. It should. It should not be changing any unbilled time, uh, any any entries that are unbilled. So, uh, if that's occurring, then I would call support and find out what's going on there. Because as you'll see, even in 
I believe in 2.6, it should be, it's essentially designed to, to, to only affect time that is, on, that is already posted and uh, in posted batches. You might want to double check to make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, posting your bills at the end of your billing process because, again, um, so I've had firms who have not posted uh, the, posted their bills after their billing process, which will, Juris will let you continue to do, but it's missing a key flag that it doesn't know that your billing process is done. And so uh, check that first, and if that's not working, or if that is, if they are posted, contact support and find out if there's um, possibly a limitation, it's a limitation in 2.6, but that does not sound right. There's, there's something going on there, and support will be able to help you through that. All right, great. Um, our next question is, I have fee schedules that are no longer assigned to clients and do not have any timekeepers, et cetera, assigned. That just will not delete. At this point, I have emptied them and noted that they are open to reuse. Is there something I'm doing wrong? Well, I mean, if they're, yeah, if that's, I've heard that before where you'll try to delete fee schedules and it won't because something is connected and the system just won't let you delete them. So that's where at least to get them uh, off your, <laughs> out of your view, uh, as we saw from that list of best practices, you can add a triple Z or a symbol, as we saw from the earlier comment, to the description at the beginning. So at least, I apologize if you're not able to get rid of them, but at least you can kind of group them together so they're, they're at the bottom of your list. And when people are looking for a fee schedule or searching for some, that they essentially won't won't see them at the you know inside the main list of them. So, um, uh, you know that that's the that's the uh, that's the, the workaround if you if you have that problem for some reason something is telling jurists that the that the fee schedule is still in use. Uh, just go ahead and adjust the description and then you know get it out of your way. All right, great. Um, our next question is: Is there a code under? fee schedule personnel types that can be used for a senior partner? Or can you only use the 10 code for partner and then type the senior partner's name and ID and their higher rate? Hmm. So, yeah, I think I understood that question. So if you, um, if you're creating, you can create a task code, but yeah, the task code is going to, I mean, you could create a task code that uh, has an indicator that only the partner should use it, but that kind of pulls you out of the Juris functionality, and um, that may not work depending on the size of your firm. So uh, you can create task codes and then give them any identifier that you want and use them in that way, but um, yeah, it's, it's essentially you're going to, yeah, you're going to have to use, um, now, now remember that if you're not using task codes, you can create a fee schedule that has that timekeeper in it with a certain rate, but again, if that if that's something you want to avoid because it creates yet another time, uh, another fee schedule, then um, look at potentially creating a task code that has that is essentially for an individual, and thereby um, solving that problem. Okay, great. And we did get um, a few follow-ups on to where you could pull the. Uh, um, Fee schedules, it looks like um, Juris queries can pull a fee schedule report by client, supplemental reports as a report that runs matters by each fee schedule, and then the master matter list query will pull that fee schedule information. Those two might be the same. There you go. So essentially, see, I like it when webinars, people help other people. You guys are closer to those reports than I am. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow here. We just have a lot of questions coming in, which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, our next question is, um, let's see, would you go over the interest slash discount tab in clients and matters? This may decrease the fee schedule list as well. So the interest discount tab in, he said in where, which section? Um, client and matters. Okay, let's go ahead. And so really quickly, uh, as the question alludes to, this interest discount tab is connected to clients and matters. Essentially, it's a way for you to, I know we're kind of getting away from fee schedules, but it's a great way if you want to assign 
an interest rate that will start accruing over a certain number of days. I can set a 2% interest rate that will start accruing for this client after 50 days, for example, and the system will do the math for you. I can even set discounts or surcharges uh, right below it. If, for example, I have a, a client that um, is just really annoying the heck out of my staff, I can put an 11% surcharge and on all the fees, and it'll essentially, guys, it'll bump up all, everyone's fees who are charging on that client 11% upwards because they're, uh, they've been such a headache for us every time they call or they've just been extra troublesome. So uh, that's essentially what these discount and surcharge options are. The tax exemption box is a, simply for those um, states that are charging taxes for their services, but from what I understand, there's only like two states in the union that have uh, the requirement of charging tax on services. And then below that, uh, you uh, these enable budgeting. This box is just for essentially very simplistic budgeting that was built into Juris really early on, um, back when Juris didn't when we didn't have Juris Suite. So if you ever want to do budgeting, I recommend using the budgeting module in Juris Suite instead of this. But you can use it. And these below are are very common in that you you can require task codes on time entries, require activity codes on time entries. Those two check boxes will keep your, your timekeepers from submitting time without the appropriate task and activity codes. So I know many of those on this, on this call probably have these checked by default because they're doing e-billing and they must have those codes or else they have to push back and have them uh, added in uh, later, which is a, a hassle. And then lastly, you can require task codes on expense code, expense entries, but that's a little less common. Uh, these are much more common. And you could set these at the matter level, or you can set them at the um, client level. So I can I can do the same thing um, here. See, same thing. Matter level, in fact, has the exact same entries. So everything I just said about those settings is true at the matter level as they are at the client level. So that was my short and sweet on that topic. I usually slow down and say it a lot slower when I teach it, but hopefully that covers it. That's great. Um, I'll try to get through a few more questions. It doesn't look like we're going to get through them all today. Um, okay. So we will go back through and try to answer as many of these after the webinar as we can and get them back to you guys as quickly as possible. I just wanted to let everyone know um, mm -hmm. that we probably won't be able to make them all today. So our next question is, if we waive certain fees for specific clients and charge for others, is the best way to handle that at the task code level in the specific fee schedules affected? And then there's a follow-up portion of, and to achieve this, would we zero the value in the line item entry for that task code? Can you read the beginning part of that question again, Katie? <laughs> yes, excuse me. Um, if we waive certain fees for specific clients and charge for others, is the best way to handle that at the task code level in the specific fee schedules affected? Mm. Okay, that, that can be done. Yeah, you could do that at the task code level, but what I've heard a lot of clients and uh, students in my classes is that if, the, if they have certain fees or things that they're not going to charge the client for a certain period of time or, or for certain reasons that uh, when they get to the pre-bill editing stage, they just go into those entries and just zero them out. Um, that can take maybe a couple minutes versus uh, if you have to start setting up task codes and associate and connecting fee schedules to task codes like I've been teaching you guys or talking about, then it sounds like it might be the best way to go. But truth be told, uh, a lot of times it, not interacting or adjusting fee schedules is probably is, is the most efficient way to do things. In other words, if you have a client, for example, that Scott is going to not be charged for the first month of uh, shipping and photocopies and things like that, then you know going into fee schedules and adjusting task codes to accommodate that and zeroing the and zeroing out those task codes, things like that, is actually you know it, it could potentially introduce confusion uh, rather than just making it a process of along when billing comes zero out those seven things, and then from this point forward, we charge for them. There's two different ways to go about it. It's, uh, it's really up to your firm as to which one of those approaches works better. If you have 187 clients who are leveraging that kind of approach, 
then maybe adjusting the fee schedules and the task codes is the better way to go. If you have three or four every quarter, then it's probably going to save you more time to just go in and adjust them on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, great. Our next question is, is there a better way to have a discount fee schedule that excludes certain timekeepers without having to duplicate it? It would be wonderful to be able to assign a discount fee schedule for the, as the foundational fee schedule, like the standard rate. Right, yeah. Um, th this is probably where we get these extremely long lists of fee schedules, which is the downside of creating fee schedules for individual clients that have a discounted rate. So it's so easy to create a new fee schedule and then um, offer that discount, associate it with the client, give it that name, and then utilize it. It's, much, it's easy to do that. It doesn't take long to do that. But what it adds to your list, or it, it eventually adds to your list. So um, I'd say the fastest way to do it is to just, yeah, create the fee schedule for that client at that discount rate. And uh, you know, you're, you're going to get a hit in that it's going to add to your list. And as we heard a few moments ago, sometimes it's difficult to then delete it from the list. And that could be a little bit of a hassle. But yeah, I can't think offhand a better way to do that. And uh, right. like I said, with the flexibility of these fee schedules, with the wonderful flexibility comes the uh, potential for a lot of fee schedules to kind of populate and become, to kind of be born. Um, so there's a, there's a downside to it. All right, gotcha. I think we have time for one more quick question. So our last question is, so if you use task codes, how does that affect the hours for the attorney? So if they have five hours and it says only one hour, does only one hour get billed? It's whatever you tell it. If you're using task codes and fee schedules, it's only using, it's using exactly what it sees in this task code. So for example, there's one created. It's going to show exactly this. So if if you are using a fee schedule, then just be uh, cognizant of whatever you put into these fields is what's going to show on the bill. So like I said, this is essentially an overriding uh, feature. It's overriding anything they're actually doing and associating it with one, one line item, one hour at $300 an hour and $300, and $300 for that, that charge. So um, yeah, so just be cognizant of whatever you decide to be your task code line item for the fee schedule is exactly what you want the client to see. And if it doesn't look the, the way you want it to, um, or it's confusing, then adjust how this looks so it's more, um, uh, it's more uh, easily to understand. How's that for good English? <laughs> I think that was great. So with that, I just want to be sensitive to everyone's time. Um, we are at 3.30. So um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up, but we'll do our best to get back to everyone pretty quickly on the remainder of these questions. So that does officially conclude today's webinar. And Paul, I'd like to thank you once again for your expert advice on today's topic. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy yeah. day to